The summer of 2022 is proving to be a summer of blackouts. Heat waves scorching much of the country, and now thousands are in the dark. There is a high risk of energy emergencies this summer. Ohio suffered rolling brownouts a few weeks ago, and now it is getting very dicey once again in Texas. The average American experienced just over eight hours of power outages in 2020. The overall duration of power interruptions in the U.S. more than doubled over the past five years. Most people don't think about electricity at all because it's such an incredibly reliable machine that runs our homes and our businesses and our lives. But the day you get up and flip the switch and the lights don't come on, that's a really bad day. And it's much worse today than it was before. Beyond just inconvenience, blackouts cost the U.S. an estimated $150 billion every year. They can also be fatal as most recently seen during the 2021 outage in Texas. Power outages in the U.S. are getting worse. This is because not that the grid has changed, but because there is so much greater threat from extreme weather and the number of extreme weather events of every kind have increased so significantly over the last decade in particular. As climate change intensifies and we see even more of these extreme events which really stress the system, we're going to see more of these outages unless we um, take action to prevent them. So why is the U.S. power grid so unreliable? And can it be fixed? The U.S. power grid is a rapidly aging system with some components that are over a century old. 70% of the nation's transmission lines and power transformers are estimated to be over 25 years old. Transmission lines have an average lifespan of 50 years, while transformers last between 25 and 40 years. Many of these power plants that we rely on were built in the 70s and are now the moral equivalent of the 1971 Chrysler Newport that I learned to drive on. But we're now in a world of Teslas, right? We built this grid for a different set of conditions. We built it for more tame weather conditions. We built it for more boring customer loads. We built it for a specific kind of power plants, large nuclear, coal, gas plants. We have not been able to think about how do we change the grid effectively to deal with all of these changes because the changes are happening faster than our ability to change the grid. Major power outages caused by weather-related events rose by 67% between 2000 and 2019. Natural disasters and severe weather directly caused 96% of the power outages in 2020. When outages occur, it's increasingly because of extreme weather conditions. Either really, really hot weather, really, really cold weather like we had in Texas in 2021, or during hurricanes, derejos, any of these kind of extreme weather events which are becoming more common. The amount of humans and the grid that it can hurt is an increasingly large target area for extreme weather to hit. We have more transmission lines, more people living in broader geographic spaces, and more distribution system that can be taken out by wildfires or hurricanes or tornadoes. Electric grids are often ill-prepared against severe weather because it relies on old historical data to plan for the future. They look at historic weather patterns and what that meant for electricity demand. But as climate change drives temperatures higher and, you know, leading to things like droughts and floods, all of which affect both electricity supply and demand, that approach is really inadequate. And we can't design a reliable system based on the conditions of the past because those conditions won't exist in the future. The utilities know how to work in the existing system and there are a lot of risks and financial dangers and shareholder issues and financial analysts with short-term incentives to just keep doing what you're doing and we'll worry about next decade, next decade. Despite the Biden administration's effort to improve the electric grid, the federal government seems to lack the power to modernize the national grid. Electricity systems are an area of shared federal and state jurisdictions and is one of the factors that contributes to the complexity of sort of modernizing the grid and building out additional infrastructure. I think there is a lot Congress could do here to help modernize our power systems. We're in a place right now in the U.S. Congress where Congress just doesn't seem to do big things, particularly in terms of regulation. Congress does like to dole out money for certain projects, but they don't really like to regulate industries the way they once did. Certain state and regional regulators often have political incentives to fight against changes to the power grid. 
The state entities that regulate electric utilities are called state public utility commissions. And in some states, those commissioners are elected. So if we're talking about making investments that are going to be really expensive and are going to be increasing electricity bills, they might see a lot of pushback from customers about that, and that might affect their chances of re-election. There were a total of 549 policy and deployment actions on grid modernization during the second quarter of 2022. Of the $12.86 billion in grid modernization investment under consideration, regulators only approved $478.7 million during the quarter. People don't want this kind of infrastructure, quote unquote, in their backyard. So while everybody agrees that the infrastructure is needed and that the projects are valuable, they tend to be very, very hard to cite. However, those who are directly affected say there are valid reasons to fight against such disruptive projects. Not in my backyard, NIMBY, is a slur because of course people are going to care about what's in their backyard. I use solar on my farm. I use solar for fencing. I have solar on my rooftop in my barn. So we're not opposed to solar, but it doesn't belong on farmland. It doesn't belong on agricultural zoned area. It certainly doesn't belong on timberland. These projects are very destructive to the land because you have to come in mass grade a lot of projects. It means you're clear cutting trees, you're clear cutting farmland, you're putting gravel roads, perimeter fencing, hundreds of thousands of acres of glass panels. Efforts to modernize the grid often target rural communities as the site for massive projects. We're trying to do what's right by our county. We're trying to preserve the rural nature of our county and really convince that our elected officials that the rural character is more important than, you know, caving in to developers who are sending a lot of money or promising a lot of money when we see other counties really struggling with this issue and suffering from the consequences. In many cases, utility companies themselves are also at odds with grid modernization, which could hurt their profit. Utilities are century old companies that have local monopoly privileges and they are focused on those local service territories that is the consumers that they have the exclusive right to deliver power to and they often are not incentivized to build the sort of big power lines we really need stretching across large parts of the country because they're so locally focused and in fact bringing power in from other places can actually harm the power plants that they own. Even if the updates were to be carried out, the $2.5 billion approved by Congress to modernize and expand America's power grid is far from enough. The consultancy firm Marsh McLennan estimates that 140,000 miles of transmission lines will have to be replaced before 2050, which will cost the U.S. more than $700 billion alone. But what's more important is ensuring that the investments are spent where they're truly needed. You know, we should be doing that in a considered and careful way so that we're not just sort of throwing money at the problem. The industry has not been investing in sort of the right types of lines. Often they've been just rebuilding last century's grid because that's the easier thing to do rather than thinking about creating a larger network that we need to really meet this century's challenges. Improving America's power grid is still achievable with the right focus. This problem is absolutely solvable. It is going to be costly, but the benefits will really be significant in terms of reliability. The more we expand the transmission grid, the more we have regions that are able to depend on each other, and the better we are able to interconnect and add new generation onto the grid as well. Investing in energy efficiency could also be a step in the right direction. Energy efficiency is things like improving building envelopes to keep more cold air in in the summer and hot air inside in the winter. The high heat conditions drive up demand for electricity because everyone's operating their fans and operating their air conditioners. If we invest in more efficient appliances, that brings demand down, it reduces the stress on the system, enhances the resilience and reliability of the system, and it saves all of us money because we're using and paying for less electricity. Renewable energy in the form of solar and wind can not only slow down climate change, but provide a reliable and domestic source of energy for American consumers. The U.S. has been making swift changes in response. The share of renewable energy and electricity generated in America almost doubled from 427 billion kilowatt hours in 2010 to 826 billion kilowatt hours in 2021. The Biden administration has also made promises to reach 100% clean electricity by the year 2035. 
but more investments are needed to meet the ambitious goals of clean energy. The transition to renewables is hugely important to avoid making the climate impacts that are already stressing the electricity system any worse. The issue with adding more and more wind and solar power onto the grid, we need something to integrate it because the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. Now, eventually, we will have large scale, long duration batteries that will be that integrating technology. Or we may use hydrogen. There's a lot of interest in making hydrogen systems as an alternative to natural gas. There's a new nuclear technology that's being developed called a small modular reactor, and they could be flexible enough to be able to provide that integrating resource for wind and solar. Continuing to encourage the innovation of new technologies will prove vital in preparing for the future. This is a sector that has tremendous innovative potential. There's a lot of new companies that are interested in participating in the development of infrastructure. There are all sorts of new technologies that can help improve the resilience of the electricity system. And one of the challenges for policymakers is figuring out how to enable the innovation that's possible in this space. How do we bring in new players, new thinking, uh, new technologies to make sure that we're building a system and we're operating a system that's designed for the 21st century, not for the last century.